Because if that yes isn't burning, we can easily get drugged down into the thick of thin things uh, and just say yes to everything because who cares? There's nothing that's really inspiring us and driving us and, and focusing us and focusing our time. Helping you design your roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. This is Win Today. And now, here's your host, Christopher Cook. Hey friends, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today for episode 262, where we're talking with my good friend Jordan Rayner about approval addiction, the dark side of discipline, and how to discern urgency. In fact, today, you'll learn that time and energy management is not an exercise to achieve inner peace. Instead, because we already have access to inner peace today, right now, Time and energy management is an expression of the gift of peace we've been given. In fact, I'll add this, a stewardship of it. Guys, this is not about being busy or simply even productive. This is about living an effective life of stewardship. Listen, this life is a blur and I want to live it well and I trust you do too. So quickly, before we head into our conversation with Jordan, if you're enjoying the podcast, please do share it. Send a text to a friend or a family member right now and invite them to listen to this episode as well. And then do me a favor, rate and review the podcast wherever you're listening, specifically Apple Podcasts. Here's why. When you rate, review, and share win today, guys, the listenership grows and we get to help even more people design their roadmap to wholeness from the inside out. It's as simple as that. So thank you for listening. Thank you for doing that. And right now, my conversation with my good friend, Jordan Rayner, all about approval addiction, the dark side of discipline, and how to discern urgency. Guys, buckle up, take some notes. You're listening to Win Today. Well, hey, my friend, welcome back to the podcast. Yeah, it's great to be here, my friend. Thanks for having me. Jordan, it's been a minute. Actually, the last time you were on the podcast was uh, late 2019. We talked about Master of One. Yeah. And uh, we haven't seen each other in a couple of years, but things have been well. Things have been great. And it sounds like things Good. have been well with you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, I, I'm really excited about this conversation, Jordan, not just because I get to catch up with a good friend, but I think the, as I told you before, we hit record here today, the specificity of the content that we're going to talk about today is really unique and it's not something we've talked about. So guys, today we are talking about time management in a way, but we're going to bring a totally different angle to it. And Jordan, here's where I'd love to start. You know, the last time you and I were together, we talked about, as I mentioned, how to become a master of one instead of a jack of all trades. Yep. Today's conversation feels like a page turn it is. on how a master of one functions. And that's focused and accurate, but zoom out with me. Uh, I want to explore why we're so distracted by the next shiny object instead of staying focused on the next right thing in front of us, which then collapses our ability to manage our time, our energy, and our priorities well. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think it's because now more than ever, we are seeing a lot of us, not all of us, but a lot of us are seeing more opportunities than ever before, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it can be very distracting in making us question, is the thing I'm focused on right now the best thing to be focused on at this given moment, at this given season, within this given season of our careers, of our professional journeys, right? And I think a lot of this stems from just a lack of confidence that people are focused on the work that God has created them to do in this world, which as I talk a little bit about Master of One and, and a little bit more in Redeem Your Time, I think we've over mystified uh, in the church, right? Like your mission is the same as mine. Our mission is to glorify God, period, full stop. And in his grace, he's just given us a lot of freedom to choose how exactly we're going to do that, right? So we got to make a choice, be confident, in that choice and get focused on what Paul says in Ephesians 5, 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We are running out of time to do the work that God has given us to do in this lifetime. I think the pandemic has exacerbated everybody's sense 
of the fact that this life is but a vapor, right? Oh, so so let's redeem our time in the present, mm-hmm. not for our own fame and fortune, but for the glory of God and the good of others. I want to put a pin in the Ephesians 5 principle because it's yeah. actually some of my favorite stuff in the world to talk about. But I, I want to put a pin in that. I want to pause. Just talk straight to the listeners real fast because I want people to lean in and engage, Jordan. Like, we've had the time management conversation before. Yeah. We've read the time management books why open this box again? And this is what I teased in my first question. Like, what's the nuanced angle that we're going to go after today? Yeah. So, uh, listen, I've spent my whole career obsessed with this topic. I've read more than 40 books on time management, uh, including a lot of the ones from great guests who have been here on the podcast before. Yeah. Uh, I have two huge problems with the vast majority of books in this crazy cluttered category. Number one, they tend to be centered on what I call works-based productivity, right? So nearly every time management book says, hey, listen, you're feeling stressed, you're feeling swamped, you're feeling overwhelmed, follow my system, do exercises X, Y, and Z, and then you will find peace. But as a Christ follower, we could start with the opposite premise, what I call grace-based productivity, which says that through Jesus Christ, we have peace with God, as Paul says in, in Romans 5.1. Now, we do t- time management exercises X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. We don't do them to get peace. We do them in response to the peace we've already been given. And, and that's just a radically different way to approach time management. Mm. The, the second problem I have with a lot of books in this category is that they fail to account for how the author of time managed his time. When he came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ, right? Like Christian or not, I think it's pretty hard to argue with the fact that Jesus was the most productive human being who ever lived. And yet I've never read a time management book that studied how he spent his time on earth. You might not think the gospels have a lot to say about this, Mm. but they do a lot. We could talk about that. I'm sure we will throughout Mm -hmm. the rest of the conversation. You know, the gospels don't show Jesus with a to-do list or a calendar, But they do show him dealing with distractions at work and fighting for silence and solitude and and seeking to be busy without being hurried, right? In other words, they basically show him struggling with a lot of the same things you, Chris, and I and our listeners struggle with today. And so that's what this book really is, right? It is based on grace, not works. And two, it's showing through the life of Christ these seven timeless time management principles, right? And then I've then mapped those principles to more than 30 hyper-practical practices that help us all walk like Jesus walked today in the 21st century. Wow. I I don't want to get ahead of the game here, but just to go back to what you said about um, the person of Jesus, who is arguably not only the smartest, best leader ever to walk the earth, but also he, he knew how to manage his priorities and time. I'd like to propose initially in this conversation that our ability to establish boundaries, to say yes to the right things, no to the things that might even be good, is predicated on our ability to discern our identity and uh, and really our, our core purpose. What do you think about that? No question, right? It, 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 it's this idea I talk about in the book that the gospel, which as a Christian is the core of my identity, makes up who I am. Uh is paradoxically this thing that makes me both ambitious and restful, right? So uh, I'll give give you a story that I think illustrates this well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have three young daughters, a seven-year-old, five-year-old, and two-year-old. Every single night, every single night, before I put them in bed, last thing I tell them is, hey, girls, you know daddy loves you no matter how many bad things you do? They're like, yeah. I was like, you know I love you no matter how many good things you do? Like, yeah. So who else loves you like that? And they always say Jesus or or Kate, my five-year-old theological stickler says, God the Father, God the Son, <laughs> and God the Spirit, which I which I absolutely love. But we need to hear the exact same thing spoken over us. This is the core of our identity. We are children of God, right? We are adopted into his family. We are loved just like a child is, no matter how many good things we do, no matter how productive we are, no matter how unproductive we are. And once that's the core of your identity, there's such great freedom and rest there. But ironically, it's that rest that leads us to want to be wildly productive. Not because we need something, 
we need to prove something to our mm-hmm. Heavenly Father, but because we want to make him happy uh, by doing his work, by doing good works in the world that bring him glory. Mm, that's good. Okay, so if we were to just kind of investigate this this issue that we're talking about today, number one, what's the killer in the in the crime scene, if you will? What's killing our ability to stay focused, to manage our time, to manage our energy? You know, I was talking with our mutual friend, Kerry Newhoff, about this, managing our energy. And uh, if we were on the crime scene, Jordan, you're the coroner. You're investigating the scene. Um, number one, what's the killer? Number two, as the coroner, what's the root cause of this then? Yeah. So uh, I, I don't think I'm going to give the obvious answer. Because uh, listen, Great. there's lots of culprits. There's lots of murders in this scene. This was not a, a solo crime, right? Mm-hmm. There were lots of culprits. So the, 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 listen, the easy answer is uh, distractions, digital devices, news. And, and I get to all that in the book. You do. But the core issue, the core criminal here is death, right? We are living lives that our souls tell us should not be finite. We know, we long for timelessness. We long to live and work forever. And Ecclesiastes tells us that was placed in our hearts by God himself. Sin has screwed that up, has ushered death into the picture, ensuring that we are all going to die with unfinished to-do lists. We are all going to die with what Carl Raynard said, uh, unfinished symphony. So death is the ultimate culprit. That's what we're fighting against as we redeem our time. Now, as we seek to steward our time well in the present, there are lots of other sub enemies of that distractions, uh, saying yes to too many things, not being clear on our priorities. But death at the end of the day is the ultimate enemy in our fight as Christians. We don't believe this death is just something we accept like other religions do. Death is a lie. Death is an enemy. Jesus said that emphatically at the resurrection. That's what we're fighting against. Mm, which proves, and so so funny, I was just uh, uh, reading this this morning, Psalm 90, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. And, and again, I think that's the priority shift that we have. But um, one of those culprits that I'd love to poke for people yeah. is approval addiction. So our struggle to say no and um really behind that so why do we struggle with approval addiction so much that saying no feels like a personal indictment because if we don't wrangle this thing we're never going to manage our time never going to manage our energy we'll be at the whim of every person because we feel like that's the way to get our approval your thoughts one of my favorite questions to ask Mm. when i'm trying to decide if i'm going to say yes or no to a request for my time is Am I trying to do good or make myself look good by saying yes to this request for my time? Because oftentimes, Chris, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think what we're doing uh, when we're saying yes to these things we know we should be saying no to uh, is looking for approval, which will never be found uh, satisfactory satisfactory with with, with other people. It, It cannot be found outside of Christ. As going back to the gospel, if our identity ultimately is in God has saved me, I'm an adopted child of God. I'm secure regardless of whether I say yes or no to this request for our time. We're secure. Now, the agendas of others, which are constantly distracting us, are replaced by whatever we feel the Lord has called us to do on his behalf in this world, right? Mm. Uh, That Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. puts us in a much stronger position to stay focused on the work that we believe he's called us to do. Now, that said, I think there's some times where we have to be sacrificial with our time. I, I think conventional sure. business wisdom on the word no is garbage, right? It, it's basically, I heard one TED speaker say one time, it's either hell yeah mm. or no. It's like, that's garbage. That is not the example of Jesus uh, in the gospel. So there are some times that we say yes, but there are other times we say no. But unless that identity is clear and secure, regardless of circumstances, yeah, it's going to be really hard to, one, get clear on what you're supposed to be doing in this life, and two, say no because you're constantly going to be uh, afraid of upsetting other people uh, and thus losing your very sense of self. Yeah, and it's losing our sense of self that I think opens Pandora's box to this because I've been in in show prep for this and just my own uh, personal growth time um, studying the urgency effect, which is when we let unimportant tasks take over our days. So why do you think that happens? 
Yeah, I think a lot of times it's because we have failed to give every minute of ours a name before we get those minutes. Dave Ramsey. That's good. Built a heck of a business on a very simple concept of a budget and giving every dollar a name, as he says, Mm -hmm. before you hit your budget account. And listen, like I know very few people who don't budget where their money goes. And yet, I know very few people who budget where their time goes before they get a fresh supply every morning. By God's grace, all of us can earn more money. None of us can earn more time. It's foolishness. So kind of the climax of this whole book, Redeeming Your Time, chapter seven, is about building a time budget template for your day, for your week, and making sure you're clear on these are the important and non-urgent things I want to get done tomorrow. this week. Because if you don't put those blocks in first, you're going to spend your entire day in reactionary mode responding to the urgent right that's a big that's not the only piece of this puzzle Mm -hmm. but it's a huge piece of it so you know in that in that template are we talking about spending our time on paper first you know as if we were to do a budget 100 percent. now i don't mean literal paper necessarily i'm not going to sell you a planner but yeah that's the idea here it's well it's so funny because i actually meant literal paper i actually have carved out on paper so i can see okay i know where my hot zone is in terms of my ability to stay focused where my best work is done and um, that that's like sacred time you know but uh, we'll get into that more but 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 the, but the, other, the other issue yeah. here too is you know uh, people are giving themselves way too many opportunities to be okay. distracted by the urgent throughout the day what do you right? mean by that I talk about yeah, yeah so chapter five fifth principle of the book is all about Jesus's ability to be uni present, fully focused on one important person or thing at a time. It's a wild idea if you think about it. omnipresent God for 33 years became uni present, confined to one place at a time in the person of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, and um, so many of us act as if we are omnipresent like God and could be in multiple places at the same time rather than modeling Jesus's uni presence. And this is, uh, really vividly clear in the way we treat messages, the way we treat emails, the way we treat text messages, with notifications on these things on all the time, you are asking and inviting the urgent in your life nonstop. I I use this analogy in the book. Imagine if instead of dropping the mail off at your mailbox once a day, the mailman started delivering the mail to your front door and he just leave it there. He rang the doorbell every time, 150 times a day. You got up from whatever you were doing, opened the door, grabbed the piece of mail. Maybe you open it, maybe you don't, but at least you steal a glance at who sent the message and and you know whatever. That's exactly what we do with our email. And that's insane, right? We have got to take control of when we check our messages if we're going to be unipresent with our important work and the important people in our lives. In the book, I show... Exactly, I do that. We can go there if you want, uh, but it's criti- It's a critical habit to develop. Yeah, I, I, I do. And the first thing, though, is like, what's informing that? Like, what's the egocentric lie that yep. we all believe? Then, yes, that synchronous response to everyone else is absolutely what's demanded of us. Like, what? What's that believed lie? Because when we believe the lie, we empower it to to just take over. I think there's a few lies. Okay, going on here. Number one, I think it's this like makeshift savior complex. Like if we're really uh-huh. honest, we love being needed, right? Like I, I, I used to do this a lot. I don't do it as much anymore, but I used to complain, quote unquote, slash humble brag about how many emails I would get in a day. I'd be at dinner with you, Chris. <laughs> and be like, oh man, I'm just like bombarded with emails. My team constantly needs me. What I'm saying is look at how important I am. Oh my gosh, like the whole world needs me in order for it to keep spinning. This is garbage, right? Like we, 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 we have a savior. We don't need to be our own savior. Get over yourself and get back to depth and the work that God has called us to. So I think that's, that's one is the savior complex. I also think there are a few lies that I help dismantle in the book uh, that keep us from taking control of checking our messages. You know, you know, number one, this lie that people expect you to respond to, to messages immediately. 
Sometimes that's true. Mm -hmm. In my experience, more often than not, uh, it's not true, right? It's just an issue of setting expectations. And number two, people are afraid they're going to miss something urgent, right? Napoleon in the heat of war waited three weeks before he opened mail. Three weeks. Napoleon. Right. And guess what? When he opened the stuff, he said, get nothing was urgent. And the third, the third Whoa. objection, the third lie I hear from people all the time is, um, you know, I need the VIPs in my life to get a hold of me whenever, wherever. And if I turn my email off, they're not going to be able to do that. And that's just not true. And I outlined some very clear steps uh, that enable the VIPs in your life to get a hold of you so that everyone else is ignored temporarily while you're fighting for depth and doing the deep work you believe God's called you. Yeah, it, that whole savior complex is really a big deal because for those of us um, who are type A and believe that uh, achievement is somehow correlated to our inherent worth, I mean, goodness gracious. I mean, you're aiming the crosshairs right on me right now, Jordan. And yeah, it's, me too. it's, yeah, absolutely. The savior complex is really a big deal. And I think we have to know how to discern urgency right that's really yep. it it's it's the discernment to say what is urgent what can wait what doesn't even need to be answered like some things like you said don't even need to be answered like if we're yeah. really 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 needed and i'm actually gonna uh start doing this soon is i'm gonna keep my phone out of my bedroom right now i just put it on airplane mode yeah, yeah. so at least wakes me up it's my alarm clock but I've been thinking about like, if I'm really, really needed, someone will find me. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Urgency, truly urgent things almost always come from the people you care about the yeah. most. Your spouse, your kid's school, your boss, your assistant, whatever it is. So great. Make a list of those VIPs. Mm -hmm. Give those people and those people alone unfettered access to communicate with you at any time of the day mm -hmm. you know very simple put them on put them on your favorites list on your iphone or your people list on sure. your Android. yeah right? they can break put jail. Disturb, mm -hmm. and you solve the problem mm -hmm. you solve the problem those people can get a hold of you when truly urgent things pop up nobody else can right uh and in reality those are the only people who are who are going to have something that's true that you would agree is truly urgent well, well, take us, there's a sidestep to this. Take us um, yeah. to where you talked about in the book on how we should allow those closest to us, our friends, to curate information for us. I thought this was really good. Yeah. So uh, the third principle of the book is what I call dissent from the kingdom of noise. Mm -hmm. When you look at the Gospels, Jesus spent a phenomenal amount of time in what the Gospels call lonely places or solitary places which th listen this stands in stark contrast to our lives today we are living at a time of unprecedented noise of non-stop news mm -hmm. non-stop buzzing our devices so one of the 32 practices in the book is what you just alluded to let your friends curate the news for you right and what i mean by this is um i'll illustrate with a story about six years ago i quit news cold turkey nothing uh, to this day, really? I read no news websites, I watch no news TV, I listen to no news on the podcast. And surprisingly, maybe to some people, I'm not ignorant, right? Like, I know what's going on in the world that matters to my life and to my work because my friends tell me about all these things. Uh, I'm a huge Tim Keller fan. When Tim Keller tweeted that he had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, I didn't know of that. My friends. Oh yeah. What? You didn't know this? No. Yeah, yeah. Keller announced he was diagnosed with cancer. This was um gosh, I think this was like January of this year, maybe something oh, like that. Oh my goodness. It's really sad. Th thankfully, he just posted a, a really good update that I again heard about from my friends. But listen, he posted this diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Eight of my friends texted me the news within 10 minutes of it breaking. Mm -hmm. I hear about pandemics i hear about hurricanes and race relations and media trends and rumors about every new taylor swift album because i'm a huge closet swifty uh and i hear about all these things without spending a single moment on news services and social media that 99 percent of that content is useless mm -hmm. and anxiety inducing right so uh, you know I, i've heard some people say hey th that practice sounds really selfish here's the deal i want my friends to dissent from the kingdom of noise too but they just choose to consume more information than I do. And that's fine. Your friends are going to do the same. They will continue, most of them will continue feasting at the all you can eat information buffet 
but they will willingly and naturally and largely unknowingly curate news for you. They'll go to the buffet stand, bring you back the banana pudding, and you don't have to get out of your chair. Please, please, please let them. Uh, This is one of the most liberating and life-changing practices I've ever experienced. Yet the same people in our lives also need to have boundaries set. And I know the nature of boundaries has a negative connotation, but boundaries are actually a really good thing. Um, I want to talk about boundaries in relationships as it relates to this. Adam Grant, I I love his work, says, if you don't communicate your limits, people won't respect them. So is part of this, Jordan, learning uh, today about getting clarity on what really matters so knowing when to say yes or no is more discernible then? 100%. Yeah, it's it's why there's a whole chapter of the book. One of the seven principles is prioritize your yeses, right? Uh, I'm a huge Broadway musical fan. Every Are you really? Musical, I am. What's your favorite I one? I love it. Uh, this is going to sound cliche, right? Uh, but Hamilton's Hamilton. easily numbers one through 10. But right now, I, I'm really I'm really digging Dear Evan Hansen. Uh, interesting. which I loved. It's now going to be a movie that's uh, coming out. Have you seen this? No, what's interesting is I'm not a huge musical fan, but um, yeah. one of my friends said to me, because I'm a musician, Chris, yeah. you, you've got to you've got to see Hamilton. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll give it a shot. You know, because I love history. I love American history. Um, I love music. And my mind was blown because I didn't expect the, and I grew up in a multi-ethnic church, so like urban music, gospel music, yeah. funk, soul, and I live in Detroit, it's so in my blood, yeah. I yeah. was blindsided by how good it was. So I'm starting to open my uh, my window of, of reception I mean, a little listen, bit more. I mean, listen, that's the pinnacle. That's the pinnacle, right? But all okay. right, let's bring it back around. To yeah, sure. We justice. can go where, yeah, go wherever, yeah. Uh, but we can talk about Hamilton for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> but I couldn't, Hamilton, yeah. every musical, if you don't know this, has what the writers call a great I want song, where the protagonist comes on stage and sings crystal clearly, this is what I want. I had no idea. Yeah, so Hamilton wanted his shot. Ariel in The Little Mermaid wanted more. Tony in West Side Story wanted Maria, right? You and I have to metaphorically sing our own I want songs, getting crystal clear on this is the thing I want for each of my callings. Yeah. And that thing has got to be big. It's got to be hairy. It's got to be audacious in the words of Jim Collins in order for there to be a burning yes inside of us that helps us say no to everything else. Because if that yes isn't burning, we can easily get drugged down into the thick of that's thin good. things uh, and just say yes to everything because who cares? There's nothing that's really inspiring us and driving us and and focusing us and focusing our to-do lists. So what do you do then in the case of coming out of the last 18 months when anxiety, languishing, and overwhelm are just knocking at the door of people's hearts and they've lost the fire? Yeah. Is it sort of an exploratory endeavor to figure out what that best yes is then? So maybe there's like an initial season. If I'm thinking about the the trajectory of this journey, maybe initially it's I'm going to say yes to more so that I can say, no, that's it. Yes, that's it. No, that's not it. Like, what does that look like? Any thoughts on that? It takes a ton of experimentation, right? You you can't know what to say yes to mm-hmm. until you tried a bunch of different things, right? Oh, that's true. Uh, but, but listen, I, I think this isn't something you can figure out in 10 minutes after listening to this podcast episode, right? Thank you. <laughs> this takes right. a lot of time. Right. A lot of prayer, a lot of discernment. I, I, going back to things I hate about time management books, those 45-ish books I've read in this category, they all treat this as if it's easy. Go, Just go read the introductions to 10 of those books. All of them are like, listen, uh, I figured it out and solving your time management problems is going to be easy. Yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't get it. Uh, absolute lie. You know how I know? Because we still work under the curse. We still live under the curse. At redeeming your type, even with the best resources in the world, is going to be hard. And I think when you understand that, you can come to these resources rightly and say, this is going to be a really helpful tool, uh, but nothing but Jesus Christ is going to solve all my problems. And that is truth. And that's where readers need to enter into this book and any other book they ever read on this topic. Because if you're expecting me or any book to solve all your problems, you're going to be woefully disappointed. Well, I'm really glad you went there because I actually was going to ask you, 
and I underlined it in the book. A lot of people think if I get the right system, set the right goals, uh, architect my day, and I'm going to throw myself in the, uh, in the barn for a second and say this, even if I plan my ideal week, this thing's going to be like clockwork. And you're saying, nope, it's not. No, no, it's not. Now, I wouldn't have written the book if I didn't think this book could help a phenomenal amount of people. And listen, don't listen to me promote this book. Please just go read the reviews on Goodreads. I've never seen more life-changing reviews on a book, mine or anyone else's in my life. Like what? Uh, sure, sure, but, sure, sure one. Like what really stuck out to you? Yeah. So uh, we're hearing people say that for the first time ever, they've read a dozen time management books and yep. this one has solved their problems. Uh, I saw another guy who, before reading the book, was spending six hours on his phone and is now spending two. Right? Whoa. Uh, you talk to another woman who identified with having severe ADD all of her life. And it was very crippling uh, stigma for her. Mm -hmm. Coming out of the book, she says she's the most focused person in her peer group. And she doesn't even identify with ADD anymore. But again, listen, these wow. are awesome. And this, this is not me. This is the Lord working in these people's lives. But as I've told these people, I'm not solving all your problems. I can't do that. I can't handle that pressure. I'm just as broken as you are. By God's grace, I've been taught a lot of these principles. And I've had a wildly productive first 10 years of my career, right? Uh, but And now I'm sharing those with you. But I can't solve all your problems. At the end of the day, some of your days are going to blow up. And as, as long <laughs> – if your identity is in your productivity system and how productive you are instead of in Christ, eventually you're going to be devastated. And so I'm trying to use this topic to bring people constantly back to the gospel, right? Like this is the root cause. This is the root of our peace. And we got to grasp that if we're going to redeem our time well. Well, that resonates with me so much. And I don't say this just because you're a friend of of mine, but I say this in truth as I was reading it because I'm a very disciplined and very structured person. And there is a huge difference between being disciplined and being structured. But I find myself sort of riding both of those decently. And I have days where I'm like, nope, not going to happen today. And I'm sure there are yep. people listening right now going, yep, right with you. There's no way this is going to get done today. And, and that's fine. But I found myself reading your book going, oh, Oh, this is actually going to galvanize the systems I already have in place for uh, my structure, my day, my time management, because the why is even clearer. And that's, I think, the strength of what you wrote, Jordan. Oh, uh, you're very, you're very kind to say that. So you're, you're an Enneagram one, right? I am. Oh, yeah. yeah. So oh, my gosh, I'm an Enneagram yes. three. I have a lot of one tendencies, but like you, yeah very disciplined person and and i, I want to make sure we talk about this because i think it's important take us there right discipline's now discipline's a discipline's a good thing jesus was disciplined he prioritized his yeses he accepted his uni presence on and on and on paul all throughout paul the apostle paul's letters mm -hmm. celebrated discipline discipline is a good gift from god that said as with any good gift from god our danger, especially as Enneagram 1s, Enneagram 3s, disciplined, highly productive people, is to turn discipline into an ultimate thing and thus turn it into an idol. And that Ooh. could be disastrous. Uh, for, for me, Ooh. I know I've crossed over to this dark side of discipline with yes. one of two things happens. Number one, I am unwilling to extend grace to others who mm. are less disciplined than me, right? So somebody shows up late to a meeting or drops a ball on a project. I will, I will likely, by God's grace, never yell or berate them. But internally, Chris, sometimes, man, if I'm honest, like I could just be seething with the self-righteous anger of like, oh, how dare they show up late? Even though I've done the exact same thing a hundred times, right? It, it, it's total elder brotherness. Uh, alluding to the prodigal son there. Uh, so that's number one. The second sign that I've crossed over to the dark side of discipline is when I'm unable to extend grace to myself. And that's the bigger story. I suck at that. I suck at that. Like, yep. here's the deal, right? In both cases, the gospel is the solution. If my identity is rooted in the fact that the God of the universe died 
for me, right? Like, who cares if I was unproductive today? I mean, I do care. I don't want to be callous no, no. about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I am secure. I am loved. Like I said before, no matter how many good things I do, no matter how many bad things I do, no matter how productive or unproductive I am. Uh, and that's what enables me to say, okay, today wasn't great, but I'm loved. I'm secure. I'm going to go get eight hours of sleep and wake up the next day and try again. Stay here for a little bit more, if you would. I want to hear more about the dark side of discipline. Any thoughts? Like, how does it show up? Because it's really poking the box in my heart right now. And have I want to talk about it a little more. Have you read The Prodigal God by Keller? You're the third person that's asked me that question. And the answer is no. So I'm going to All read right, it. So, so, so read everyone listening should go read that instead of my book. I'll put a link in the show uh, notes, I mean, guys. I mean, redeeming your time too, but go read The Prodigal God. I'll put a link in the show notes, so, yeah. The Prodigal God, short book by Keller, uh, expounding upon the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son, right? And in The Prodigal Son, if you're not familiar with it, Jesus talks about these two brothers, right? The one brother is the brother that gets the majority of the attention in the parable. He's the younger brother. He's kind of the free spirit. He's a typical younger brother, right? He's the Enneagram free spirit. seven, dare I say? He goes off. Exactly. He's an Enneagram seven. He <laughs> Sorry, sevens. Off. Oh, my God. He, uh, he, he squanders his father's wealth in yeah. partying. Maybe he's a four. Whatever. Was it maybe? Maybe he he's a four. Be. And he comes back and the father forgives him. Not, not only does he forgive him, he welcomes him back. He throws a feast oh, yeah. for his son that is now returned. Well, the elder brother, very much an Enneagram one, uh, comes to the father and says, how dare you throw a feast for my younger brother? Here I have been obeying you, following your commands. And this brother of mine who's a loser, obviously these are not Jesus' words, I'm paraphrasing, right? My loser brother comes back and you're celebrating him? We, I'm an elder brother. You, I would imagine, Chris, have more elder brother tendencies than younger brother tendencies and the problem yeah. is oh, yeah. older brothers we get our identity our, our temptation can be to get the core of our identity from being self-disciplined from being highly productive from killing it at work and again these are not bad things they're good things but when they're ultimate things we become jerks and the the the, the, the heart of it is we've forgotten the father's grace Right. The fact that the elder brother lived in the father's house was by the father's grace, even yeah. though he was obeying his rules. It's all grace. And that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the dark side of discipline, man. When I when I find myself there and feeling like I deserve things uh, because I've been so productive or whatever, that's a dangerous spot to be in. And it's 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 a pretty rough spot for the soul to be to be in that position. All right, so I, I just want to say, because it so resonates with me, I'd like to propose, and we're not going to stay down this uh, this trail, guys, but uh, Jordan, I'd like to propose that the younger son, he wasn't in the house for a season, which means he wasn't home, but I'd like to propose that in equal fashion, the elder brother, though he was in the house, wasn't home. No doubt. No doubt. He wasn't experiencing sonship. That's the issue here. The elder brother, The elder brother is thinking that his father should love him because of all the good things he has done, right? His identity is still in his circumstances, not on his father's unconditional favor and love. So no, he's not experiencing true sonship because that's true sonship with a perfect heavenly father that loves us. Again, I'm going to say it a million times, regardless of how productive or unproductive we are. That's how we're loved. Okay, so... I, there's a, a shadow, another shadow side of discipline that I want to poke with you for a second because I'd like to propose that there are people who are really good at time management and, and that's a great strength, but any strength overextended becomes somehow a liability in our ability to interface and cope with the world around us. And so I'll give you an example, back to the elder brother and we can relate it and unpack it as you wish, but I'll just say this personally, bitterness at the root manifests in through shame self-promotion which then says look at my ledger look at all the things that i'm doing well therefore i have it coming to me i i'm owed this and i'm not trying to wax philosophical so 
Yeah, no. But I'm just saying, I think there's a shadow side of bitterness that plays into this that we think, therefore, we have to continue to work, to work, to work, to work, to work. Somebody see me. And you're saying, Jordan, back to where we started today, that the essence of effective stewardship of this thing called time, because we all have the same amount, the effectiveness comes from awareness of belovedness, identity, and working from rest and love, not for it. That's exactly right. Because when you really get this at a soul level, your motivation to be productive is off the charts. Off the charts, Uh right? It's this beautiful paradox. I have this peace, I have this rest, and now I'm going to go be wildly productive. Not because I need anything from my father, but because, man, I love him. It's the kid. Think of two kids at the Little League. Great. One kid gets up to the plate and his father is berating him uh, after every miss, after every strikeout. That kid goes to the plate scared because he's got something he needs from his dad, his dad's approval, and he wants to hit a home run so his dad will stop yelling at him. The second kid goes up to the plate with his dad encouraging him every time he strikes out, knowing that he's okay and saving his father's love. Who's more motivated and, and we're talking about sustainable motivation yeah. to do right by their father? Man. It's the kid who has unconditional love. He's going to swing for the fences, not because he has to, but because he wants to. And he wants to bring his father pleasure, right? Uh, this is the core of so much of our time management problems. I wanted to go beneath the surface. I'm tired of hacks. I'm tired of one-off tricks that Thank are you. here today and gone tomorrow. These are the core issues here. And Jesus is the core solution to the problem, Mm -hmm. right? Like, again, in two ways, he gives us peace, but also he shows us the ideal model to follow, right? He shows us what it looked like in the first century. I believe in this book, I've shown the principles, mapped them to practices and helping us do this in the 21st century. Uh, but, um, yeah, we know how God would manage his time. Go and learn and do likewise. We'd be foolish not to. I want to take this conversation somewhere that I promised we would early in the conversation. And that goes back to Ephesians five. And I loved that you talked about this early on in the book. So I want to unpack Ephesians five verses 15 through 17 in context. As I said, it's one of my favorite set of verses for a few reasons. And I primarily study out of the Amplified. So here's how it reads, Jordan. It says, look carefully then how you walk. Live purposefully, worthily, and accurately. Not as the unwise and witless, but as the wise, sensible, intelligent people making the very most of time, buying up each opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, oh my gosh, I love this part. Do not be vague and thoughtless and foolish, but understanding and firmly grasping what the will of the Lord is. So talk to me about those three adverbs, purposefully, worthily, and accurately, and what it means to live those those things in the world, to live purposefully, worthily, and accurately. It's like seeing, we'll never hit a target we can't see. Yeah, totally. Those three adjectives, I love the way it amplifies. Isn't that great? I, I, I love it. Those three adjectives are part of our response to the gospel. And that's the context of Paul's writing in Ephesians 5. He, Paul basically spends uh, the whole first four chapters of Ephesians preaching the gospel. Gets to Ephesians 5.1, reminds us of our that we are quote dearly loved children of god mm-hmm. and then ephesians 5 15 through 17 is our response to god what's our response to the gospel see then that you walk circumspectly not as fools but as wise redeeming the time being purposeful what what, what did it say what did verse 17 yeah say? It, it purposefully accurate purposely worthily and accurately and then he goes on to say don't be don't be vague and thoughtless <sighs> yes don't be vague and thought we are so many Christians are living such humdrum, vague, thoughtless lives. And we call it loving. Oops, I just said it. Yes. Oh my, oh my gosh. Preach. Yes. We got, ah, oh, like, yeah, I'm just, you know, loving my, listen, Paul was pretty good at loving people. Jesus was pretty good. I'd say. At loving people. Uh, and man, were they purposeful. Dorothy Sayers, I love, have you, have you ever read Dorothy Sayers? I'm really embarrassed to say no again. Oh my gosh. John Mark Comer actually just dropped a a list on me. Dorothy Sayers, 
was a good friend of C.S. Lewis. She was a hugely popular uh, detective novelist uh, in Oxford at the time. And she wrote this brilliant 12-act play that's basically a dramatization of the Gospels. It's brilliant. C.S. Lewis read it every single Easter until the day he died. It's called The Man uh, Man Born to Be King. And it is just this beautiful line about Jesus. Uh, She said, Jesus had a, quote, purpose harder than steel. Freaking love it. We see Jesus as a soft, Let's go. loving guy. And listen, uh, as the Gospels portray, he was loving and gentle guy. But he had a purpose harder than steel. He knew exactly why he was born into this earth, what he was called to do. That led him to say yes to things in line with preaching the Gospel and in action and deed and no to everything else, right? Look at Mark chapter 1. Look at all throughout the Gospels. He's saying no to non-essential requests for his time so he could redeem his time, his limited time. He knew the clock was ticking, right? And he redeemed his time for the purpose of the Father. We got to do the same thing. Okay, so this plays into a present bias then, which says that it is our tendency to choose smaller immediate reward over a larger reward in the future. So the question is then, Jordan, how do we develop awareness of the future? And I think we just hinted at it in Ephesians 5. How do we develop awareness of the future and then harness discipline and boundaries today? We're we're coming full circle with this. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, the only way to do this is to be in the Word on a regular basis. The word tells us where the future is going. The uh-huh. future is going to God's eternal kingdom being on earth as it is in heaven, period. That is the bookend of history. And with that in view, we can redeem our time. When, when Paul talks about redeeming our time, he's not talking about, you know, managing your calendar better so that you can make more money and build a bigger house, right? I'm not saying that's always a bad thing, but that's not the primary motivation here. He's saying buy up the time. I love that Amplify puts it that way. Yep. Buy up the time. Ransom the time redeem the time for the purpose of the Lord because the days are evil and we are running out of the time that we have in this life to build for God's eternal That's kingdom. it. So once we have that eternal picture in view, that helps us greatly prioritize what on my to-do list is in line with God's to-do list, right? And being serious about those things and being comfortable that we're all going to die with unfinished things on those lists and God's going to complete them in his own time. Okay, so what's really interesting about even what you just said is that I've been writing a lot and then posting. I, in fact, I, just, I posted it last uh, last week on Instagram about how to curb morning anxiety and depression. And uh, this resonated with a lot of people. So anyway, I shared my morning startup habits, Jordan. Yeah. What do you think people do that unintentionally then train wrecks the morning before they even get started. And the reason I even bring this up now is because you had talked about being in the word. Well, one of the things that I do in my morning routine is I bought a whole set of index cards and I sort of actually just frame this up over the last week that every day in my devotional time, I'm going to, I'm going to extrapolate one verse that sticks out, write it down, change it to first person. So I personalize it, write it on an index card And my goal is by the time I'm 60 years old, I'm going to have over 8,000 cards that I can pass on to my sister's kids. So anyway, this is about putting the word in my heart. And I've done some neuroscience research to see what happens when we put words in our on our lips and speak them out loud. And anyway, that's part of my my startup and uh, just wanted to share that. But like, what do you think people unintentionally do to train wreck the morning before they even get started? They, They look at their phone. It's real, real simple. It's number two on my list. Real, real simple. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, to descend from the kingdom of noise the way Jesus did and, and model that in the 21st century, I think that mandates significant amounts of time away from our digital devices. This yep. is not commanded in scripture. No, this is my opinion, right? But what's not my opinion is Jesus spent a ton of time in solitude. And we can't unless we parent our phones better, right? So really my good. phone stays in bed, uh, not my literal bed, in my master bathroom away from my bed. And it's proverbial bed uh, from 7.30 p.m. every night uh, till 7, 7.30-ish a.m. the next morning. So I wake up at 5, mm. right? So that gives me two and a half hours before I've looked at any inputs in the day to just read and meditate on the word, spend time with my kids, disciple them, serve them well, have fun with them in the morning before school, spend a couple of minutes with my wife, 
uh, before I look at my phone and get going with my day. But I love what you said about the index cards. I think quiet times are really tough to get right and make meaningful. Um, years ago, I started modeling Martin Luther's method of Bible study, which I love. It sounds pretty similar to yours. So he would take a passage of scripture and he wouldn't just read it. He would write out four things. Uh, number one, the passage's instruction. Number two, something in the passage that led him to praise God for about God's character. Number three, a confession about the passage. And number four, supplication. Just asking mm -hmm. for the Lord's help and living out that command. And I've been doing that for years. Uh, and man, it just transformed the way I read the word and apply it to my life. It's a beautiful thing. That's good. Do you know Hannah Brencher? I love Hannah Brencher. So yeah. it's, uh, the reason I say that is uh, bring Hannah up is she's a sweet friend. But she told me last January, she showed me she has this phone box. And I'm like, I got to get a plastic phone box like Hannah so I can just put the phone to bed awesome yeah go read hannah's by the way to, to 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 plug the book shamelessly go read hannah's hannah's endorsement of redeeming your time she it's endorsed it oh i gotta go i gotta go read it i didn't know she, endorsed it. Her. she basically said she's the bomb read this book and it will absolutely change your life uh she was very very sweet she's sweet hannah lane if you're listening right now we love you we love you hey i you know to that jordan i've been practicing writing things down in an almost kind of brain dump way like the little things, the big things, all the things. And the point I think is that there's just no way we can process our thoughts if we keep it all in our head. And honestly, this is a, this is a big nod to David Allen, who you referenced in the book, um, his work, of course. But I'd love to hear your thoughts and experience with categorical decision making. Yeah. So the essential step to this, which the vast majority of people I know don't do, is what you just talked about, getting these things, these commitments, I call them, David Owl calls them open loops. Yeah. Out of your head and into a trusted external system. Because, number one, if you don't, you're going to drop the ball eventually. And number two, these open loops cause a phenomenal amount of anxiety and stress. If you've ever been particularly overwhelmed, listener, maybe it was a week before your wedding or a few days before you... Uh, turned on your out of office reminder because you were going on vacation. Mm -hmm. So overwhelmed, you had to make a to-do list and you just wrote 12 things down. I can almost guarantee you, you felt some sense of relief just by making the list, even though you didn't do a single thing on the list. You don't have to do things and knock things off of your to-do list in order to feel less anxious. You have to get the open loops out of your mind into an ex external system so that you can see them all, categorize them all, and then make decisions about what's best next, what's got to get done next. There's a whole chapter of this book. There's a whole chapter of Redeeming Your Time dedicated to this idea because this is the only way I believe in the 21st century to model Jesus' ability and obey his command that our yes be yes every single time. If we got open loops, commitments we've made to ourselves and others only in our heads yeah. or our email inboxes, our yes is not always going to be yes. There's just no way. We got way too many commitments flying out. You said then that you and I have a moral obligation to seek out solitude as we try to redeem our time. That plays right into it. There's a moral obligation. Why? Because without silence and solitude, number one, we can't be Christ-like. Like, I didn't look, go, okay, go I got to slow you down. I got to slow you down. You just said without, without silence and solitude, as if that's not an option. We can't be Christ-like. Okay, why? To I mean, we got to like stay Jesus. here. Okay, let's stay here. I'm not talking about obeying the command. Jesus never commanded that we be silent and fight for salt. But, but what does it mean to be Christ-like? It's to walk like Jesus walked. Go look in the Gospels at the number of times yes. Jesus withdrew to lonely places. Luke 4 through 6, in like a chapter and a half in that span, three times it mentions him withdrawing to lonely places. And I, I think... This is because, number one, we need silence to hear the Father's voice, right? And just on a practical level, we need silence to be creative. We need silence to think. I think it's fascinating that the, the most significant period of solitude we see in Jesus' life in the Gospels is right after his baptism, right? He comes out of the water. The Father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. If there was ever an opera, if there was ever a time where Jesus was going to kick off his preaching ministry— you would think it'd be at that unbelievable moment. But instead, 
It says the spirit led him to a wilderness for 40 days of quiet solitude. And it was only after those 40 days that he came back in the fullness of his strength to do battle with the devil and to kick off his public ministry. If Jesus needed that much solitude, we do too. That's what I mean when I say if we want to be Christ like, again, I want to be crystal clear. Mm -hmm. No commands in scripture to be silent and quiet that I see, except for be still and know that I am God, right? But nothing in Jesus' words. But in his example, Mm -hmm. in looking at the biographies of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about how he walked, yeah, this one's a non-negotiable for us. We are morally obligated to do this if we care about doing our best work for God's purposes in the world. Well, it's really fascinating because um, do you know who Evagrius Ponticus is? Have you heard of him? No. No. Third or fourth century writer, John Mark told me about him. And basically, he's an early desert father, and he really talks in that about how the lies of the enemy come in. You know, uh, I've read oh, yeah. that some theologians think— This is re- in John Mark's new book. Yeah. I did read this. Yeah, yeah regarding um, Jesus' experience in the desert, that he came to him in thought, in suggestion— and it's in that place that he had the ability and the space to be able to negotiate and go, oh no, what's truth in this? So I just think what you said is really important because as we carve necessary space for silence and solitude, we can hear clearer, <laughs> we can discern better, and we can negotiate with the lies and say, nope, that doesn't belong. Because I'd like to propose that when we don't manage our time correctly when we don't harness the stewardship of this thing called life as you talked about in the book the byproduct is it's way more severe than being caught up in just busyness it's actually the chance that a little leaven is going to leaven the whole lump and our entire ship of our life is being steered degree by degree way off course And I'm not trying to wax philosophical, but I'm just saying that if we don't do this, what I hear you saying is in, uh, we're we're setting ourselves up for trouble. We're setting ourselves up for big trouble and and just out of line with Christ's example. For Christ's father, that should be enough. Say, man, Jesus did, just go read the gospels. Jesus spent time time in solitude. What does that mean for me? And I think we're gonna look around, realize how noisy our world is and fight for solitude in order to model Jesus' example. That's really good. What's fake productivity then? Yeah, fake productivity is incredibly common. (laughs) Uh, Fake productivity is this idea of doing work, busy work, Mm -hmm. that looks important and makes us look busy to our bosses, to our coworkers, but has zero meaningful input towards our goals. Talking about checking emails all day, going to meetings all day. Not saying that some meetings are very important because they are. I hate meetings. Uh, that's big for <laughs> And here's the deal. It's way easier to go through life being fake productive than sitting your butt in a chair for two hours and writing something great or planning out some new great strategy for your nonprofit. Fake productivity is so much easier. That's why so many of us opt for it, right? But I'm not in this for life to be easy or for my work to make me more money. I'm, I'm in this to do more good works for others. And I believe that requires depth and real productivity that's connected to real, big, hairy, audacious, kingdom-sized goals. Yeah, you're landing the plane in such an effective way because what I hear you saying through this is this is, this is not obviously about a busy life. And in fact, this is not about a productive life. This is about an effective life. Yes, that's exactly right. And there's a big big difference between those things and an effective life is one that is done uh in accordance with god's commands with his agenda Mm. for the world and his will is that we would redeem our time as paul says right for his glory and the good of ours that we would do more good works yeah yeah bring glory to the father as jesus said that's so good jordan rayner author of redeeming your time master of one call to create it's so good to have you. Is there anything else that we missed today that you'd just like to share with the listeners? I think you got it all, man. Um, no, I would just say this. Uh, the days are evil. If, if there is anything we've seen over the last two years of this pandemic, it's what James says in James 4. This life is a vapor. It is short. Like I said earlier in the podcast, we're running out of time. The clock is ticking. And that shouldn't scare us, 
but it should compel us to just get in the game, uh, to get engaged with the work that God is doing in the world. Be- not because he needs us to, not because we need to, but because we want to be a part of the blessing of being a part of what he's what he's up to, right? And that requires redeeming our time, managing our time as wisely as possible. Um, and hopefully this book's going to help a lot of people do just that. So good. Guys, go to the show notes right now. Get a copy of Jordan's new book, Redeeming Your Time. Jordan, hey, I know you want to tell people about an opportunity, how to connect with you. There's something coming up. Share that. Yeah, Yeah. so uh, I'm a big believer in going totally over the top with uh, pre-order incentives. Yeah, yeah you so are. So here's the deal. Uh, hopefully this conversation was enough to convince you to give this book a shot. If not, go read the reviews. Uh, and if that doesn't convince you, well, if you buy the book before October 23rd and go to jordanrainer.com and fill out a form we got right there, you're going to be entered to win a trip for two to the Holy Land uh, or a cash prize of equivalent value, whatever you want. Why the Holy Land? Uh, because this book is all about walking like Jesus walked. So I was like, yeah, we 100% have to send somebody to go walk where Jesus walked for eight days and I'm paying for everything. It's going to be epic. So again, <laughs> step awesome. one, go get the book on Amazon, wherever you want. Step two, go to jordanrainer.com and you'll be entered to win. Oh, so good. Hey, how can people stay up to speed with you on on the socials? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. At Jordan Rainer everywhere. Best way to find me is our email list at jordanrainer.com. We get a free weekly devotional that goes out every Monday morning called The Word Before Work. Helps you get your mind straight and connect the gospel to your work before you kick off your work week. Uh, It's completely free and that's where you can find everything. All things Jordan Rainer right there at jordanrainer.com. I appreciate you so much. Thanks for this conversation today. Thank you, Chris. Hey, guys, go to wintoday.tv slash episode 262 right now. Within the show notes is a link to purchase a copy of Jordan's brand new book. You'll be able to register for the free trip he mentioned, as well as a link to the Tim Keller book uh, Jordan mentioned in the conversation. So go there right now, wintoday.tv slash episode 262. And listen, in two days, another fresh episode of the podcast. Rebecca and Gabe Lyons join us. We're talking all about surrender, control, and your emotional health. Here's a preview. And we can take on these things a little better than if we were just living as those who are just being impacted and affected all the time and not proactive in how we're going to to be prepared for that. And we can only... And we can only take it on if our output exceeds our input. Because what's happened is you had a lot of people sitting at home having no agency and they didn't leave their homes. And they're taking all this input in that they're no, they don't even have capacity to solve. So I felt like the cadence was off. We, we're just absorbing. And so we're gorging ourselves with information and we have nowhere to put that level of stress. So that's why we can't sleep. That's why we're so stressed. There's no, our physical bodies aren't getting rid of that stress. So I just had to get real diligent with uh, so many of us, right, during COVID to get outside. I mean, for me, at least an hour every day where I'm moving. I, I just, I just, to me, that was like, okay, God, it just remind me of like my frailty in the scheme of your creation. And you are, it, we're gonna be okay. Rebecca and Gabe Lyons join me two days from now. Don't miss it. Thanks again for joining the conversation this week right here on Win Today. I believe people just like you should be able to live successful, meaningful lives. And that's why I want to invite you to join the inner circle of readers on my email list who get weekly, well-researched self-improvement tips. So right now, go to wintoday.tv to sign up. It's absolutely free. And lastly, whether you're a new listener or have been listening to the show for a while, I'd really appreciate your rating and review of Win Today on the Apple Podcast app. So right now, will you write a short, honest review? Doing so helps expand the listenership of Win Today, and that would mean a ton to me. Thanks again for listening today. I hope you have an awesome week. We'll talk to you again really soon. Bye-bye.